Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this open ground, is out and more. What height of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still and striving cease, my comforter, my all and all, here in the love of Christ. You're saying the words, but I don't hear your hearts. Here we go. In Christ alone, took on flesh, fullness of God in hell, blessed be this gift of love. Righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross that Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin it was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. Here in the ground. Light of the world, by darkness slain. Glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his, and he is mine. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry till final death, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of death.
You know what a Bible rap is? A Bible rap is when you open your Bible and read something. Tell me somebody next to you shake your hand and say, Get in your Bible ups today. Would you do it? Okay, thank you so very much. We welcome you to this time of worship and praise on the campus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. And uh, once again, we welcome especially the participants in the XL07 uh, conference that is going on. Would you all just raise your hand and wave at us, please? Hey, thank you. Good. Now, folks, be sure you thank some of them for what they've been doing to help our seminary, our city, the Mississippi Gulf Coast. If you see somebody wearing a lanyard around their neck, that's the tip-off, okay? Be sure you tell them thank you for all that they have done for us. Today, as a part of that conference, we're happy to sneak away uh, one of their speakers to be with us, Dr. Craig Connor. He is the pastor of First Baptist Church of Panama City, Florida, a native of Florida. He did his master's work here at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, pastored for many years at Gulfport before God called him uh, over to Panama City. Never lost his heart for the Gulf Coast. And when Katrina came, his church adopted a church, uh, helped them very significantly financially, paying staff salaries, so many other things. And we appreciate that kind of active compassion that he has practiced in the wake of the challenges that we've faced. But even more than that, I appreciate the fact that he is a man of God who loves God's Word, loves to preach. So be getting your Bibles out and loose and handy as we prepare for a message from the Lord. As But now, let's turn our hearts once again to another time of worship. Dr. Farrington. Sing with me. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all and all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now. I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's scars and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin and left a crimson stain. paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as Paid it all, all to him I owe. 
Sin had left all crimson stain. all the people said, Amen. 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 I appeal to your brothers in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and in thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. And still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you not baptized in the name of Paul? No. I am thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so no one can say they were baptized in my name. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, the power of the cross.
Well, amen, and thank you for the wonderful music. And Dr. Kelly, thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. Uh, I am so honored and so humbled to be able to stand in this place and preach the Word of God. Uh, good to see uh, uh, one of uh, the members of our church in Panama City, Jared Berry, a student here. This is his first semester. And Dr. Kelly, I was telling someone earlier that what uh, appealed to Jared to come to New Orleans was uh, the emphasis that you put on missions and evangelism here in this place. And we praise God for you doing that. Good to see my friend Bruce Raley. Bruce was on my staff for about eight years uh, at Panama City, and we loaned him out to Lifeway to see if he could help them. But uh, it's good to see you, Bruce. Uh, I invite you to open your Bibles with me today to the book of Acts, chapter 2. And I want to look at uh, a couple of different passages of Scripture today. Uh, Acts chapter 2, I want to read a couple of verses and then uh, end up over in Acts chapter number 4. But uh, for about the past uh, 25 years, uh, I have given my life to church growth. You know, there are some things that we believe in. Uh, there are other things that we could say that we are committed to. And then there are those few things in life that we are really passionate about. Now, I'm a guy that is passionate about church growth. And the reason I'm passionate about church growth is because I am passionate about the will of God. And church growth is the undeniable will of God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, maybe I ought to kind of define what I mean when I'm talking about church growth. I'm not talking about simply uh, swapping sheep or maybe as sometimes it might just be the exchanging of the goats. But uh, I, I'm talking about uh, reaching men and women and boys and girls with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I mean when I refer to church growth. And I tell you, I thank God that when I was a student here at New Orleans Seminary, that my three evangelism professors, Dr. Kelly... Dr. Randall, and in the last uh, few months, Dr. Wilton, really fan the flame of the priority of evangelism in my soul. And you know, that is a fire that was kindled in this place that has not gone away now for 18 years. As a matter of fact, it has intensified, but I go back to when that flame first began, and it was here in this place. So I thank God for these godly men who did that. And, you know, those of you who are here today, no matter uh, what area of ministry that you are preparing for, the truth is you are preparing yourselves to leave this place to be a tool in the hand of God that He can use you to grow His church. And, you know, when we look out at the culture in which we live today, I really think that the culture in which we live compels us that we do this with a sense of urgency. I really am convinced that the only solution to a society that grosses millions of dollars a year off of the sale of pornography and a society that kills its children inside of their mother's womb and a society that can't build enough prisons to house its criminals and enough rehabilitation centers to help its addicts, I really believe that the only solution is the church growing through the conversion of the lost. Because would you not agree that when people get saved, society always gets better? Amen? And so that's the only hope that we have for the culture in which we live is to grow the church. One thing I've discovered over the years is that anyone who is successful in any endeavor of life, they always have confidence. If you do not have confidence, you are not going to be successful. And I believe that you can leave this place with confidence that you can go to any church in any location and you can grow that church through evangelism. And you know, any master craftsman always has a, a, a primary tool or resource that he uses in his craft. And the same is true with building the church. There are a lot of different things that we use, and yet there is one primary resource that we must use. You know, when I look out at the church today, there, there's so many different ideas about what the church ought to be. There's the, the emerging church, and there's the, the splurging church, and sometimes there's even the discouraging church. But there really ought to be the flourishing church that is committed to growing it through evangelism. 
And you know what I think? I really believe that God in His Word is trying to communicate to us how He wants to do it. Now, I've been a pastor for quite a while, and there's one thing that I've learned, that in communication, you always have to have two parties. One sending information, and the other receiving the information. And if there's a breakdown, then communication doesn't take place. I heard about this lady who went to see an attorney to get a divorce. And the attorney asked her, he said, well, ma'am, do you have grounds? She said, yes, we have about an acre and a half. He said, no, that's not what I mean. Uh, tell me, do, do, do you have a grudge? She said, no, we have a carport. He said, no, that's not what I mean. Tell me, does, does he beat you up? She said, oh, no, I get it before he does every morning. He said, lady, that's not what I mean. For heaven's sake, what's the problem? She said, we can't communicate. <laughs> I can understand why, can't you? Well, I, I think that God is trying to communicate to us today, this will work to grow my church. But I wonder, are we listening to God as he's communicating? So I want you to look in Acts chapter 2 and look at verse number 41. In verse 41 it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now stop right there and look at Acts chapter 4 and verse number 31. In Acts chapter 4 and verse number 31, it says, When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Now, I don't have time to read the rest of the text, but I'll just come back and pick it up in a few moments. But there are, are just two simple truths that we see out of these verses that help us in growing the church with confidence. Number one is a conviction about our resource. A conviction about our primary resource. Now, the Bible says that they spoke with boldness, but the question is, what was it that they spoke? Obviously, it was the Word of God. Now, you know, there are many different methods that we use in speaking the Word of God. But, friend, I want to tell you, if, if the emphasis on growing the church is not upon the Word of God, we are using inferior resources. The greatest resource that we have is the Word of God. Why is that? What is the Word of God? It is immutable. That means that it does not change. Jesus Christ is what? He is the living Word who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible is the written Word that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Did you know that if that were not true, and if the Word of God were not immutable, and if that were not the primary resource for evangelism, and God simply just changed His method about every 30 or 40 years, boy, we would be in a mess, wouldn't we? But God doesn't change His method. It has always been the same for saving people. The main resource is the Word of God. For example, you go back to the very beginning in the book of Genesis, and we read about the conversion of Abraham. And the Bible says that Abraham believed in the Lord, and the Lord counted it unto him for righteousness. What did he believe? He believed the Word of God. And down through the eons of time, what we find is that God has been saving people through the primary resource of the Word of God. When God sent the prophets, He did not change His methodology. For example, let me read to you out of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55, verse number 10. The Bible says, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth uh, and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. Now, what is it that pleases God? It's the conversion of the lost. The Bible says it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come unto repentance. And friends, I want to tell you, if there is a lack of a harvest in your church or in my church, the problem is not with the seed. The problem is with the sower. Because the Bible says that if the seed of the Word of God is sown, the promise is it is going to yield a harvest. And did you know that God did not change His method when He sent the apostles? 
For example, in 1 Peter, listen to this verse, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Now, dear friends, what I'm simply saying is this. Anyone can grow any church through evangelism if the Word of God is their primary resource. And I really believe today that we are trying to invent so many new ways to try to reach unsaved people that we have forgotten the old proven way that works every single time, the power of the Word of God. And if you and I have a conviction about our resource, that will lead us to make two commitments. Number one is, we will make a commitment to proclamation. Did not the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, I am an expository preacher. I am committed to expository preaching. I do this in my church. Week after week after week, I get up, I get a book of the Bible, verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept, and I just preach through the Word of God. Because I have seen in over 20 years of being a senior pastor, that's the one thing God always honors. Friends, listen, preaching is everything for the pastor. Did you know that the church will rise or fall depending upon the strength of the pulpit? And it is a regrettable tragedy that in many of today's churches that the priority of preaching has been lost. It really has. You know, when we are living in a day and we'll have a service where there is 15 minutes of drama, nothing wrong with that. 30 minutes of singing, nothing wrong with that. And leave 10 minutes for the preacher to give a devotional thought, something's wrong with that. The priority of preaching has been lost in a church like that. So to grow the church, preachers must major on preaching. The great John R. Stott said, and I quote, The standard of preaching in the modern church is deplorable. He said, There are few great preachers today. Friend, I want to tell you, when preaching is weak, the church suffers. And when the church suffers, all of society suffers. Because the church is the moral compass of the culture. The church is salt for a decaying culture. It is light for a culture that's living in darkness. Dr. Henry Drummond says, compared to the pulpit of the last century, the pulpit of today is decidedly weaker. Did you know that many believe that the last great period of great preaching was at the turn of the last century? Stuart Briscoe says, and I quote, Today's sermons, compared to sermons of 100 years ago, seem like little sniglets. Now, I don't know what a sniglet is, but I'm just guessing that's not a compliment. When he said, you look at the sermons of today compared to a hundred years ago, and they're just nothing to them. Dear friend, the modern preacher, though, is the preacher that thinks somehow he's got to stand up and entertain the congregation. He's always looking for something novel rather than proclaiming the old, old story. And above all else, God has called the preacher to do what? Expound the Scripture. God has not called the preacher to be a comedian a psychotherapist, but one who rightly divides the word of truth. Only the church can do that. And if the church doesn't do that, who will? So here's my question. Do we have a conviction about proclamation? Do we believe that the gospel of Christ that we read about a few moments ago out of 1 Corinthians is the power of God unto salvation? Do we believe that God's plan to save the world is through the foolishness a proclamation. Why is it that in Baptist churches and in Baptist seminary chapels that we put the pulpit in the center of the building and not off to the side? It is because architecturally it makes a statement that the eyes of all of the worshipers are to be focused upon the life-giving and life-transforming power of the Word of God. Now, friend, don't misunderstand me. I am not opposed to new methods. I am not opposed to that at all. That's not what I'm saying. 
but I am vehemently opposed to anything that relegates the proclamation of the Word of God to a secondary status in the life of the church. It's not the plan nor the will of God. So if we have a conviction about our resource, then we will make a commitment to proclamation. But listen carefully. We'll also secondly make a commitment to education. To education. Did you notice in Acts chapter 2 verse 42, the Bible says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. I really do believe that the churches today that are growing the strongest and reaching the most people are those churches that have made a commitment to Christian education. And i tell you what I think that we need, <clears throat> maybe most people don't care what I think, but I think what we need in our Southern Baptist Convention today is a revival of the ministry of education. I think that if we're going to ever have a revival of the ministry of education, there has to be a revival among pastors who will see the importance of the role of the minister of education in the church. The minister of education, who is he? On many staffs, he's nothing more than just an errand boy, just simply to do what the pastor does not want to do. I tell you, the pastor ought to see that role as a significant role in the life of the church. And that pastor ought to be committed to calling a God-called man who believes in the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God, that he knows that will develop ministries in that church where the Word of God is taught. I am a Sunday school man without apology. I am committed to the ministry of Sunday school. I believe in it with all of my heart, and I could give you 10 million reasons today why I believe that Sunday school is much more effective in church growth than in small group, than small group ministries are. And for the life of me, I can't figure out why so many pastors in our Southern Baptist Convention are throwing Sunday school out the back door when it has proven over the years to be so effective in reaching people for the cause of Christ. Friends, Sunday school is extremely important. Why? Number one, that's the place where we teach the Word, right? Where we teach the Word. Did you know that we can uh, make it in our churches without a lot of things? But friends, we can't make it without a good, strong, solid, sound, systematic, continuous Bible teaching program. Why is that? Because that is what gives doctrinal health to the life of the church. And I want to tell you what, doctrinal health to the life of the church it's what a good foundation is to a building. You know, it's what a good engine is to an automobile. It's what cash flow is to a business. You just cannot survive without that. And that is what Sunday school does. Friend, when you connect the right curriculum, the Bible, with the right person, a godly teacher, and you put those two things together, spiritual things begin to happen in the life of the church. So the church, listen, that majors on the Sunday school says we have a program here that focuses on teaching the Word of God. I tell you why I believe in Sunday school. Not only because it's the place where we teach the Word, it's the place where we evangelize the lost. The purpose of the Sunday school at First Baptist Panama City is to evangelize the lost. Now, you know the statistics. If not, you'll learn them before you leave this place. You ought to know them already. One out of three people who are enrolled in Sunday school get saved. That cannot be said of the worship service. I would to God that one out of three that I preached to in four services this past Sunday, that one out of three of those would have come to Christ, but they didn't. That cannot be said for small group ministry. But Sunday school, one out of three who are enrolled get saved. Isn't that worth paying attention to? <laughs> Certainly it is. Maybe you're thinking, well, Pastor, man, get out of the dark ages. This is a new day. No, friend, I want to tell you, this is a sad day. It's a sad day. 46,000 churches in the Southern Baptist Convention. Last year, 50% of those baptized less than five. Last year... 10,000 of those churches baptized none. This is a sad day. I tell you, I am humble before God, but I am privileged to be the pastor of a church 
that was in the top 100 out of those 46,000 in baptizing people. Why? We focus on Sunday school. And we get them hooked up to Sunday school. And they hear the Word of God. Why, why does it work? Because Sunday school follows the Great Commission pattern. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You go, you teach, they are converted, you baptize. So they are not going to be converted so we can baptize until they are taught. And in Sunday school, we have curriculum that is prepared that systematically goes through the Word of God. And yet we say, well, I'm not going to use that. we got to use something else. Maybe that says something about our lack of commitment to the Word of God. So number one, there is a conviction about our resource. But number two, very quickly, a conviction about results. Now, why is it that we use the Word of God as our primary resource? I tell you, when you read Acts chapter 2, and you read Acts chapter 4, it's amazing to see the results that occurred because they spoke the Word of God with boldness. Now let me make a statement here that I believe in with all of my heart. What we wear, whether it's a suit or whether it's shorts and flip-flops, is incidental. What our worship style is, whether it's liturgical or loose, that's incidental. The songs we sing, whether they're hymns or choruses, that's incidental. What is essential it's the Word of God. And we have gotten hung up on the incidentals rather than on the essential, you see. That's why we're not seeing growth. What are the results? What does the Word of God do? Number one, the Word of God breaks and cleanses. It breaks and cleanses. Jeremiah 23, verse 29. Is not my Word like a fire that cleanses and like a hammer that breaks into pieces? I want to tell you, the Word of God, friend, the Word of God can melt the hardest heart. It can warm the coldest heart. It can appeal to the most resistant heart, just the Word of God. I was preaching revival a few weeks ago in uh, uh, Alabama. And the last night of that revival was the, some of those famous youth nights. And they had, you know, several hundred teenagers that were packed out in the auditorium. And I spotted one right in the center. Uh, this little uh, girl, about 14 or 15 years old, I stood up to begin to preach. And she had her arms crossed, had her head up against the back of the pew, wasn't interested in anything that was going on. Now, did you know that that night in that sermon I didn't have any fancy illustrations or stories to tell? All I had was the simple gospel out of 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. And you know, if I'd have had to try to argue or talk that little rebel into the kingdom, I wouldn't have stood a chance. I was convinced she could have outdefied me. But about midway through the sermon, her head came up off the pew, and she began to pay attention. I gave the invitation. She walked forward and was gloriously saved. What did it? Power of the Word of God. It's the Word of God that breaks. It's the Word of God that cleanses. The Word of God, secondly, convicts and penetrates. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, and verse number 17, the Bible says that what is the Word of God? It is the sword of the Spirit. As the sword of the Spirit, what does it do? It pierces deep into the inner recesses of the human spirit. And it convinces the sinner who Jesus is and who the sinner is. You see, human words can give counsel. Human words can give guidance. Human words can give direction. But only the Word of God can penetrate the deep recesses of the human heart and produce conversion down on the inside. Word of God is all that can do that. Well, Pastor, what if I'm out here and I'm witnessing to someone and they don't believe the Word of God? Use it anyway. Did you know that no sinner believes the Word of God? Or they would be an ex-sinner, right? What happened to Simon Peter on the day of Pentecost? He preached the Word of God to folks that didn't believe the Bible. And at the end of the sermon, they stood up and cried out, What must we do to be saved? It was the Word of God that convicted and penetrated their hearts. You know, we're told of the great Spurgeon. We're told that what produced conversion in his life was not a masterpiece delivered 
by a trained preacher. But just one simple verse from the stammering lips of an untrained layman who simply got up that day and quoted from Isaiah, Look unto God, all ye ends of the earth, that ye might be saved. Over and over again. And the great Charles Haddon Spurgeon was converted by the power of the Word of God. Let me tell you what else it does. It prepares and it produces. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, For by grace are you saved. How? Through faith. So what must be present in order for a person to be converted? Faith. You know, trying to get saved without faith is about as unlikely as seeing a conservative hanging around an Oscar party. It's just not going to happen. But when faith is present, I want to tell you, conversion will happen. Well, if faith has to be there, what produces the faith? Romans 10, verse 17, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I wish somehow I could convince our young Bible college students and seminarians that the purpose of evangelism is not to use human persuasion and clever techniques to somehow manipulate a confession of faith, but just to tell the old, old story. It is the power of God unto salvation. Friend, I want to tell you, the Word of God is remarkably relevant. I've preached the Word of God in Gulfport, Mississippi, Panama City, Florida, over in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Central America, South America, many other places. And you know what? It works with every culture, every people group, every age. It's amazing what it can do. Back in 1986, my first semester here at New Orleans Seminary, one of the first classes that I took was an evangelism class taught by Dr. Kelly. And it was a CWT class. And I can remember that one of the requirements for that course, I'm not sure if you still do it, was that we had to go to some area of the city and do street witnessing. I was a country boy from northeast Florida. I had never been to New Orleans in my life. I couldn't even pronounce the names of those places on that sheet that were, was handed out that we were to pick from where we do our street witnessing. I basically closed my eyes and just checked one. And it came out to be the Vukare. I couldn't pronounce it then, learned a little later how to say it. But little did I know that was the French Quarter. That was down where Bourbon Street was. And I remember the first day I was taken down there. Now, this is the truth. I'm not just preaching now, okay? <laughs> I was taken down there, and they said, Now, don't, don't go past this line right here. Because if you go down to this end of Bourbon Street, you may be mobbed. And then they began to talk to me about the people that lived down there. I, I don't know how to describe the people that lived on that end of Bourbon Street, uh, other than to say that they, they really didn't believe in the sanctity of marriage, all right? Maybe that will get the picture across. But I said, trust me, I'm not going across that, this line. I met a guy who was uh, linked, up with the, linked up with the Vukare Baptist Church. And I met a guy who was the caretaker of that church. He had been there at that time about 15 years, 17 years, something like that. And he told me his story. He told me that he had lived in the French Quarter for quite a few years as just a drunken bum. He said he slept out on the streets. And one night down there in the French Quarter, after a long binge, he passed out in the gutter. It started to rain. Someone came by and they put a raincoat over him. He said the next morning when he got up and he removed that raincoat off of his filthy body, that a good Samaritan had come by and placed a gospel track under that raincoat. He said, I got up that morning and I read that gospel track. Wasn't even a preacher around. And he was gloriously born again. That is the power of the resource that we have. May God have mercy on us 
if we do not use it. Would you bow, please? Father, thank you for the power of your word. Thank you that it's your will for people to be saved. It's your will for your church to grow. And, oh God, how I pray that through proclamation and education that we would focus on our primary resource, your word, and make a difference in the communities where we live. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.